Today on Market Journal. Harvesting during less than ideal ground conditions can make your fields a mess. We'll give you some ways to avoid soil compaction during harvest. And with cold weather moving into the area, a messy harvest season just got more complicated. Hear how long the delay may last. And get ready to take some notes on this one. Our experts will make sense of some recent changes to ARC and PLC. This week's edition of Market Journal starts right now. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Good to see you this week. Beginning today's show, recent rains are delaying what has already been a frustrating harvest season. So when there's a few breaks in the clouds, you might be tempted to head back out to the field to try and make up some lost time. However, driving a heavy piece of equipment across a wet field is a recipe for deep ruts and soil compaction. Nebraska Extension Engineer Paul Yassa has some ways you can combat compaction. Well, compaction is a loss of pore space between soil particles. Uh, I like to say soil is half there, half not there. The solids are non-compressible. And so when we drive on something when it's a little wet, we squish down, leave a rut, leave a track, that's the pore space reappearing on the soil surface. Now at harvest, there's a lot of weight on those tires going across the field and we can really leave some deep ruts in wet fields. Let that soil dry out enough to give me some uh, physical support of the weight of the combine, weight of the grain cart going across the field. But again, when you start looking at the long range weather forecast, it might be there's a rain coming in five days and boy, if I get, and get to the field four days earlier, that's gonna make a big difference. And that's when we really start causing protection problems. That kind of leads into my next question as far as any sort of equipment adjustments one can make to minimize it. Any, anything else you want to mention on that? Well, one of the key things is I tell farmers when the combine's going across the field anyway to get the grain out, let the grain cart follow the same tracks as the combine. And it could be that you're going to load the grain cart a little bit off center, or it could be you have to get a longer auger for the combine so you can get the grain cart on the same tracks. Since 85% 80, of damage is done on the first pass, don't let the grain cart do more damage. I get too many grain cart drivers say, I'm going to move over to spread out the compaction. Why would you want to compact more in the field? Stay on the same track. Now, if it's really wet, I prefer to keep the grain cart out of the field. Uh, don't add additional tracks. Keep the grain cart on the end of the field. Keep trucks on the end of the field. Don't unload on the go. I know the large combines today, a lot of farmers say, I can't afford to slow down that combine. But yeah, we might want to do that. How much weight is too much weight <laughs> to really see the effects of compaction or ruts, anything like that? Uh, how much weight is too much is always a question I get. It depends a lot on the soil type, it depends a lot on soil moisture. Some of our grain carts out there weigh 50,000 pounds on a single axle. You know, if uh, Department of Roads won't let you on concrete that's reinforced with steel with 20,000 pounds, why does the farmer think he can drag 50,000 pounds across the field? Uh, there's been a lot of research done in the past that, that 20,000 pound per axle is about the max you ever want to go. And so what I want to do is, like our trucker friends do on the road, to carry more weight safety, I add more axles. Now, unfortunately, combines don't have more axles, but grain carts are coming out now with two and three axles in the grain cart to spread that weight out. But the important thing is, to don't spread it out, put it in the same wheel track. It's okay, the guy, he's done with harvest, but his soil, it's compacted, maybe he's got some ruts in there. He's like, all right, what am I gonna do to get this soil ready for next year? What are some tips on that? Well, one of the best things is to just make a soil that's more resilient to resist compaction. Now, if we already have the ruts out there, it's going to be a light tillage operation. That light tillage operation is usually going to be with a disc. Uh, the disc will move soil side to side to fill in the ruts. That light tillage only on the soil surface. There's no way we're going to disc deep enough to get rid of the wheel traffic compaction itself. That traffic rut goes down deep. So just smooth the surface enough we can get across it next year. But the key is it should be dry when we do that, because if it's wet, that disc is just going to pack more and the tractor pulling is going to pack more. 
And so it could be the kind of thing we let it sit this fall and we hit it next spring and we hope for that dry spell there in March or April before planting season so we can smooth it a little bit. So just waiting is key then? Waiting is key and actually the big snow, uh, the freeze thaw, wetting and drying that we get with our winters, it actually reduces the surface compaction. It does not really get rid of the rut. And so again, a lot of farmers get concerned about the ruts. Well, if I got a little four row combine, I got a rut every other row, I can be concerned. But if I got a 12 row combine, and there's only two ruts across every 12 rows, maybe I just learned to manage that and just a, a little narrow disc to fill that in and leave the rest of the soil undisturbed so it's less prone to compaction next year. We've posted more resources on ways to address soil compaction on the Market Journal website. Next up, and we're going to compact a whole lot of information into this week's market segment. So much going on. Weather is one big story that we're following. We'll have Al's forecast in a few minutes, but first our analyst is tracking the weather too and seeing how yields and crop conditions could be affected. Plus, we'll get a look into where corn and soybean prices may be headed and we'll catch you up on some updates to the renewable fuel standard. Analyst and author Elaine Cub joined me on Wednesday and started by giving a harvest update where she is. Well, harvest is not really happening here at all. Um, and speaking of Nebraska, you know, Nebraska is actually the rare, almost normal spot. I think in the latest crop progress report, they were 12% harvested instead of 19%. So looking all across the corn pelt, Nebraska is about as normal as it gets. Illinois is like 33 percentage points behind their average pace. Here in South Dakota, I'd say we're about three weeks behind what we would have been expecting to be in the last few dry years. This of course has not been a dry year, but uh, the soybeans that folks have been trying to do, they've been, you know, really tough. It's been hard to do, but folks have been going at them because we've got this big storm coming and that is just making everybody filled with dread. And Elaine, I heard you interviewed on another show last week and you made mention of a harvest rally. You think that's around the corner? Yeah, potentially. Uh, I think that we've we've seen the, the general trend of the markets start to move upward now ever since that last grain stocks report. And I think the expectation has been for a harvest rally all throughout the summer just because the problems that have been happening with this crop, with the yield, and even with the acreage, how much of it is, is being lost to silage, for instance, and won't even go on to the grain supply and demand tables. All of that is not really going to be known to the market until harvest really gets going. So it's not going to be reflected in this next USDA report because they just don't have enough information because harvest is so far behind. So we just continue to wait for the, or that slow trickle of information, but that slow trickle of information, as long as it remains bullish, I think will keep this trend pointed upwards. And you mentioned weather just a minute ago as we're recording this on a Wednesday morning, forecast calling for snow, freezing temperatures to the Midwest and into the Dakotas. And we've talked about how harvest is delayed or in your case, not really happening at all. What are the effects the storm would have on yields and crop quality? Yeah, it's not pretty. It's not. I, and that's why everyone is just filled with dread. And we really don't know yet. If it was just a matter of the freezing temperatures, you know, this is mid-October. This should not be a surprise. And I think the industry has been prepared for all the late planted corn to be harvested, potentially more wet than it would otherwise be to have their drying facilities ready to go. If it was just the cold temperatures, that would be one thing. But we are also expecting a lot of snow and wind. So to the degree that that snow maybe damages some soybeans that are still on the field, which is a lot Lot of them or that the wind perhaps lodges some corn it could very easily dramatically extend the length of this harvest which was already going to be very long and I'm sure we'll be harvesting in December. Okay Elaine price outlook for corn and soybeans where do you think they'll go? Well I think they're going to continue headed up but I will point out that in soybeans, they're really only about 20 cents away from that June high. The September contract, you know, hit that high at about 948. We're really only about 20 cents away. So I am bullish. I do think we'll have a harvest rally, but I'm also encouraging folks to sell, to take the rally that we've had already and get as sold as they want to be, especially if you're going to have cash needs here in the next few months. This is a good opportunity to reward that, especially in the soybeans, to be ready in the next couple 20 cents to reward that rally. Corn, however, you know, it could keep going here, especially if we continue to see, as I mentioned, the poor yield reports from the harvest. Is there anything that you're watching internationally? 
Yeah, you know, soybeans, again, we try to get a little bit bullish based on uh, Brazilian planting at this time of year, and they are dry. So that has been supportive. It has helped the rally continue. If we see the Brazilian currency continue not to fall to any new, new lows, that will also be supportive. But all of those things are really susceptible to quick changes. We could easily see a rain come into the Brazilian forecast and, and take away that bullish uh, argument. And also big news for biofuels. Late last week, we got the announcement that there's an agreement with the renewable fuel standard. So do you think this sets some things into motion for growth as it pertains to the ethanol industry? Well, it was good news, like you mentioned, Troy, but it wasn't everything that the industry could want. I mean, I think there was the potential for that announcement to be some expansion of the, the infrastructure, more blender pumps at the, at the fuel stations. That would be important. But all they really did was bring that back to the 15 billion gallon mark where you know the mandate was already there. And what we've seen actually in the market as a response to that announcement is the RIN prices have actually dropped. So to me, that suggests that the market is viewing this announcement with great skepticism and potentially even disappointment. It really is not what the ethanol industry needed to have a boost and certainly we haven't seen the corn market respond with a big boost just from that RFS uh, statement. And what about small refinery exemptions or SREs? How are they impacted by this announcement? Well, we are still seeing the same uh, amount of ethanol as the original mandate. So it still is not uh, the standing up to the fuel or to the, to the oil and gas industry that we wanted uh, you know the government to make for us. And Elaine, wrapping up here, it's been a tough year for producers. Harvest may be shaping up to be the same way. Give us some advice on what we can do marketing or risk management wise. You know, I know that I've been bullish and I've, I think a lot of your analysts that you have on the show have, have been banging on this gong about the, the harvest rally, the harvest rally, just not to get too optimistic, um, especially when you look out towards 2020. This could be an opportunity to look really far ahead and consider that someday we will have the yields uh, that, are, that are expected and someday we will have all the acres that are expected and it would be a very bearish scenario. So to not get too bullish about any small announcements from China or any this or that and to remember to, to be looking ahead and, and marketing ahead. Thanks to Elaine for being on the show. Next week, we'll be joined by Mike Briggs over at Briggs Feed Yard. So if you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Time now for this week's trivia question. And as we mentioned with Elaine, biodiesel has been in the news. So our question for today, one bushel of soybeans can make how many gallons of biodiesel? Is the answer one gallon, one and a half gallons, two and a half gallons, or is it three gallons? Make your guess and I'll have the answer after Al's forecast. Next up, unlike the other I states, Idaho isn't known for corn production. But that doesn't mean it isn't a great place for a corn breeding facility. Nampa, Idaho's dry climate, sunny days, and relatively mild winters make it well suited to breeding corn. And that's one reason Syngenta chose the area as the site for its trait conversion accelerator facility. Syngenta held a grand opening for the $30 million facility this summer. The trait conversion accelerator facility was designed to speed up germplasm and trait development in a way that improves yield. Read about the new facility in the October Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Al Dutcher. And Al, it looks like we have some cooler weather that's moved into the area. What can we expect for the week ahead? Well, Troy, you're exactly right. We did see the cold air come in. And unfortunately, we're going to have to deal with it for a couple more days before we start to see a warming trend as we get into the middle of next week. But more importantly, this storm system that was well advertised for the better part of the last seven to 10 days, depending on which model run you looked at, really showed this snow system cranking up as we got to the end of this week and it pretty much came out as expected outside of the intense amount of per snowfall that was originally predicted with this system and some of the models were and, and some of the numbers shooting around were in the 30 plus inch range. Now we may get there but officially what I've seen is nowhere even close to that. We're basically in that 12 to 18 inch range with the high winds and with the winds that we have seen in the Dakotas it may be very, very difficult to really find out what the true totals were. But more importantly, the farther south you went, the less the totals were. And in fact, the biggest accumulations that we've seen here across the state was in the northern half of the Panhandle. Unofficial reports in the four to eight inch range, and we'll probably see a couple of events that'll be a little 
For the light sites, it'll be a little bit more than that, since they're right up in the southern portions of the Black Hills region. But overall, for the most of the state, we missed out on some significant moisture outside of some of the areas of eastern Nebraska that were caught in the early thunderstorm development Thursday morning before the cold front came in. And it's in that area between Lincoln and Omaha where we've seen some heavy precipitation break out during the early morning hours. And that passed into Iowa where they've seen more significant moisture. So for the areas that were dry slotted, particularly south central and southwestern Nebraska, the likely scenario is here, if we can get a couple good days of dry weather, we may be able to get back out in the fields in pretty short order since we were lacking in major significant moisture in this region. So as we look at the upper air models, what we'll notice is this big upper air low that was responsible for the blizzard-like conditions of the Dakotas and heavy snowfall all the way into the northern Panhandle has now moved up into uh, northwestern Wisconsin and the surface low right under top of it means that this system is going to slowly grind its way toward the northeast. And so we are going to see pivoting snowfall around this area, although the snow total should come down somewhat for our region. We're just basically looking at the winds coming out of the northwest and a very cool day ahead of us. And as we get into tomorrow, we that reinforcing shot of cool air comes in behind the main frontal boundary keeping us in the cool conditions here in the state. But the good news is we don't see any precipitation across the state. Now on Monday, we start to see another system trying to dive out of the northern Rockies. That's going to increase our temperature somewhat. So we're going to rebound back up into the mid to upper 50s north to the low 60s south. Low pressure sets up in the Texas Panhandle. But that cold front has shot off all the moisture that could be evicted toward the north. So we're looking at a dry forecast. Tuesday, the system starts to strengthen as it moves toward the east. We get the northwest flow and pretty much a dry frontal boundary passage. Another in, uh, high pressure moves in to reinforce some of the cool conditions. So we're going to drop back down into the 40s in the north to the mid 50s to the south and some slight flurry activity possible in northeast Nebraska. Wednesday, we start to see rebound in the ridging pattern, bringing warmer weather to the western part of the state. Low pressure forms in the, in the panhandle, but again, no moisture source moving northward, so a dry forecast, and it looks like a dry forecast for the remainder of the week. As we get into Thursday, yet another system starts to move through quickly through the southern plains. This should generate some moisture with a surface low developing over the Texas Panhandle, but right now the models keep the moisture well to our south across portions of Kansas into points further south, and even then it's just a slight chance of moisture. On Friday, we get that trough digging a little deeper. That's going to shoot energy in an eastward fashion in toward the southern plains. Low pressure starts to develop in southeastern Colorado, another one in north central Texas. That's going to help to funnel some moisture up and interacting with this jet stream should lay a foundation of precipitation to our south, none of it getting into Nebraska. The better news in the 8 to 14 day forecast is for next week the following Tuesday that we should see warmer temperatures at least across the central and eastern United States. Below normal, of course, with that trough coming in, in terms of precipitation, way overdone on precipitation is the main precipitation stays to our south. We should get a good, good 10 days of harvest weather, Troy. Thanks, Al. Back to trivia now, and this week we asked, how much biodiesel can you get from a typical soybean bushel? The answer is B. That bushel of soybeans will yield one and a half gallons of biodiesel. Next up, producers around the country have a big decision to make later this year. The 2018 Farm Bill has given farmers the opportunity to reassess their selections for the agriculture risk coverage and price loss coverage programs for the 2019 and 2020 growing seasons. Bill Dodd got caught up on some of the changes producers may want to take into consideration when choosing which program is right for their operation. Bill? Well, thanks, Troy. You're absolutely right. This is a very big decision, and producers need to take several variables into consideration when choosing the program that best suits the needs of their operation. Now, recently, it seems some changes to the programs and fluctuating grain prices are among some of the factors presenting challenges to producers in determining the best fit for them. As of September 1st, producers have been able to opt for ARC or PLC programs. The ARC portion of the program protects producers against revenue shortfalls. Two options were available under ARC, either county coverage, which offered protection based on a county average yield, or individual coverage, which based protection on individual farm yields. The PLC portion of the program protects producers against price declines. According to Extension Associate Professor Brad Lubin, it may be possible we see a lot of producers making a switch from ARC to PLC if prices for corn and soy continue to dwindle. We think we know what it looks like. It's still ARC and PLC, the agricultural risk coverage, the revenue safety net, and the price loss coverage, uh, the PLC program. They look an awful lot alike, uh, or uh, an awful lot like they did in the last Farm Bill. So the programs look very close, but there's a new decision. 
In 2014, we had to make a decision when we were coming off of high prices. And lots of producers, particularly for soybeans and corn, strongly preferred the ARC program. But that safety net dwindled over time to the point that now it looks pretty small. The PLC program started sort of out of the money, but as prices have fallen, PLCs become more significant. Now we look at a new decision in 2019 under different market conditions. We'll have to analyze that a little more carefully, but it's possible that a lot of producers make a big switch. So, in other words, it'll be a good idea for producers to take a good look at current prices for any given crop. If the current prices for that crop are below the reference price, PLC is probably going to be a more attractive program. If, however, the prices are above the reference price, ARC is probably going to look a bit more appealing to producers. According to Extension Educator Randy Pryor, making a snap decision this early in the process would be ill-advised. However, there is one thing he suggests producers do to get the ball rolling on the process. There's one thing uh, producers could do now. Uh, ask your FSA office to give you form FSA 156EZ. What does that form have on it? It has your base acres for the PLC program and it has your PLC payment yields as it stands right now. We have a one-time opportunity to increase PLC payment yields. So we can take a look at Take a look at your yields between 2013 and 2017. Simple average, multiply that by 0.81. Would your pay yield be higher doing that versus what is on that form right now? If you updated your yields, the farm bill before, it was the previous five years times 90%. So does the 81% beat the 90%? It's worth taking a look at even if we can just up that a bushel or two on your corn pay yield, it is worth taking a look at. You don't have to sign up for the program now. In fact, we don't recommend doing that. Wait until we have our educational meetings after harvest and Extension is gonna be doing meetings across the state. Learn what you can, but you could take a look at those pay yields right now and anticipate those farms where you can um, do that maneuver and increase your PLC pay yield. One reason it's not recommended to run out straight away and sign up this very moment is to give yourself time to go over all of your options. As Chief of Production and Compliance Programs for Nebraska FSA, Kathy Anderson states, while the program you selected under the 2014 Farm Bill was what you had for the duration of the bill's lifetime, this time around producers will be given an annual choice to stick with their decision or opt out for the alternative program. Well, it's just very important for every producer to consider all of the options. And one of the things that's um, initially important to understand is that it's no longer a five-year decision. So under the 2014 Farm Bill, producers came in, they elected either ARC or PLC, and then that decision stuck for the life of the Farm Bill. Under the 2018 Farm Bill, they'll come in, make a decision to elect a program for 2019, that program election will also apply to crop year 2020. But then each year after that, 2021, 22, and 23, they're going to annually have uh, an opportunity to make a new program election. So it's gonna be very important to consider the analysis of each of these programs and what the different characteristics are um, throughout the life of the farm bill. Now, as mentioned earlier, after harvest, UNL Extension, in coordination with the FSA, will be holding educational meetings around the state to give producers a better idea of the options they have moving forward. Now, this is something we'll stay up to date with. However, if you want any more information on the ARC and PLC programs, you can visit the FSA website at fsa.usda.gov backslash ne. There you'll find available links to tools that have been developed to aid producers in making their decisions. For now, that's all I have, and I'll send it back to you, Troy. Thanks, Bill. Great information there. Finally today, when it comes to hay, this year's plentiful moisture provided quantity, but made quality hay hard to come by. So you can be sure of what you're giving your animals, sampling and testing is the only way to know hay's nutritive value and is extremely important before feeding this fall or winter. Beef Systems Extension Educator Ben Beckman says it starts with understanding the sampling process and what the analysis says. We're looking at sampling uh, harvested forage like a hay. We usually want to make sure that we divide it into what's called lots. So a lot's going to be a harvested forage that's been harvested at a similar time of the year. Um, it's going to be of similar quality, so if we're harvesting maybe like a 
prairie hay. We don't want to be sampling the hay that's been harvested up in the hills, the same as something that's harvested down in a meadow. Um, and then make sure that, again, it's, it's harvested at the same um, stage of, of forage. So if we've got maybe a sorghum sedan or something that we planted and we planted it at two separate dates, we want to make sure that those are, are sampled separately. When you're ready for the initial sampling, it's recommended to use a hay probe to make sure you're doing the correct sampling technique. And what you'll do is go into the side of a, a bale. You want to get as many layers as possible. So a round bale, you want to go in on the round side. If we've got square bales, we go in on the um, short end and we get a representative sample out of 10 to 20 different bales in that lot. We're gonna mix it all up and we're gonna do what's called quartering. So we're gonna throw it on a flat surface, divide it into quarters, and we're gonna take two of those quarters, throw it back in, mix it up again, um, until we get about a quart size bag worth. Um, and that's what we're gonna send in for our sample analysis. If we're doing something like a silage, uh, we probably wanna keep that cold or a fresh forage just so we don't get any mold growth. If we've got a dried hay that's already been cured, you know, you can just send that in the mail um, as it is, and, and there's not gonna be any issues keeping that cold at all. Um, those silages and wet forages, probably wanna keep in a fridge until we actually get it into the mailbox. The analysis that comes back will help in determining your feed ration and allow you to make any necessary adjustments. Maybe we have hay that's a lot higher quality than what we thought. We don't need to be feeding a supplement. Those cows are going to gain condition. They're going to be just fine on straight hay. Uh, maybe we're overfeeding our hay and we can cut that back and stretch that hay resource a little while longer. On the flip side of that, we can make sure that if our hay is a little lower quality, uh, we can help you find a cost effective you know, supplement that's going to fit into our resources and, and fit into your operation. Testing your hay is critical to making sure that we're meeting our animals' requirements. We look at last year, last winter, with that really cold winter we had, some hay was just not up to par, and we saw that in our herds. They really dropped in condition score. And so if we know what's in our hay and we can feed accordingly, we can make sure that we're getting the energy and protein to our animals that they need. We've included some extra resources on hay sampling on the Market Journal website. That's going to do it for this week's show. Remember, if you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll bring you a story about the benefits of windrow grazing. Plus, we'll offer some weaning strategies for your calves. All that and a whole lot more. We'll see you here next week. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter. Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.